Hello everybody. I hope everybody is doing well today. Um, this is, I believe, uh, oh no, it's week seven. All right, so we're going to start getting into economics and policy and sustainable development this week. Okay. Remember that on the 14th, this Wednesday, there will be an exam posted for you to start taking and you'll have until Wednesday the 21st midnight your regular Wednesday assignment that's when it will be due by all right and I need them done because I got to get your midterms your midterms are due like three days after that or something like that okay so I have a timed out so I can have a good midterm grade for you and all that rig and roll um, so you do not have a Wednesday assignment next week. So this week you ha you have one though. You got to do your crazy part, or you have to do your current event that was due on week six. So this one is still due. Current event five is still due this Wednesday, and then next Wednesday you will not have one. Okay, let me get back into week six here. Where the heck am I? Week seven. You will not have one. All right. So, that's it, but you still have your chapter review due on five, okay? Can you can see here on week eight, this is where your exam is going to be, all right? It's going to pop up underneath week uh, eight's schedule, okay? Because it's due on that day, but it will still pop up. You'll be able to view it, all right? You'll get an announcement when it's totally available for you, okay? Maybe I'll put it, I don't know if I'll put an announcement on that or not. I'll make sure. I'll even send out an announcement for the thing that is available. Okay, and it will stay open for you for one week. Um, and you still have your chapter six review sheet to do there. And then in week nine, we start getting into uh, soil and agriculture. And then I added week 10 for you too. I'm um, here. So chapter 10, we're going to get into environmental health and toxicology. So I got the chapter review sheet due and current event seven. These ones aren't due for a while though. This isn't due till. Uh, November 8th, and then your current event is like two weeks away. So this is like November 11th because we skipped a week, remember? So now these are going to start being like a week later for you, right? Because we don't have a Wednesday assignment on the test that is coming up this Friday or this Wednesday. So let us get into the uh, PowerPoint here about economics and um, sustainability. This is one of my favorite uh, topics. This is what I really went to uh, college for, uh, for my P PhD. It was in natural resource management, but we talked a lot about economics, man. Holy guacamole. That's all we did. Derivatives of this, derivatives of that, derivatives of oil and lumber and all. Oh, my gosh. It was crazy. It was fun, though. I learned a lot, right? Um, so in this lecture, we're going to talk about um, how economics exists within the environment and and how we as a society actually re rely on these ecosystem services and we need to start trying to account for them just a little bit better. We're going to talk about some of the principles of classical and neoclassical economics. Then we'll start getting into what's called uh, what I like to deem ecological economics. All right. Um, where we try to value some of these ecosystems and use some full cost accounting methods uh, to try to derive what the true uh, price is for a um, product that uh, affects the environment in some way, whether that is positive or negative. Um, environment, we'll talk about environmental policies and the role of science in policy making, and we'll talk a little bit about the history of the U.S. environmental policies and laws. So the case study for this class is one of my favorite case studies, and I think I talked about this in the class uh, before, and I know I talked about it last night in my sustainable building class, uh, design class, and if you guys are interested in sustainable building design principles and stuff, um, I guess that's going to be next semester or next year. I usually do that every spring or something like that. Uh, but this spring, every fall, I mean, this spring we're doing um, – Energy conversion is stored. So the guys are interested in that sustainability minor that we have at Robert Morse. 
um, there's a class going to be offered, um, one of the first classes. And you don't have to be an engineer to take it. You could be a business major, marketing, accounting, nurse, uh, history, whatever you want. Because every aspect, every job out there needs some sustainability people. Okay? Um, and you'll use it. That's just a little quick aside. But this Costa Rica is like my favorite. So since 1980, Costa Rica has regained much of its uh, forest cover. It's an amazing uh, uh, accomplishment, right? It's called the Pagro Por Soverso and blah, 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 I don't know, the PSA, Payment for Environmental Services. It is a uh, carrot kind of uh, program, meaning we're going to tempt you by trying to give you some incentives to do some good stuff. So in 1996, the government began paying farmers and ranchers to, for, to preserve forest on the land, replant cleared areas, allow forest to regenerate, and establish sustainable forest system. So this is just like we talked about, I think we talked about the rough grouse here in Pennsylvania, right? With the first cut of the grass, they were chopping off those um, rough grouse's heads, and they said, hey, we got to stop, we got to save, this is our key, this is our flagship species, you know, the, the bird that makes Pennsylvanians feel good, if you know it's the uh, state bird, um, we started paying them not to cut their grass, right? And we compensate them what we thought would be fair market value for the grass, okay? <coughs> and Costa Rica did this on a large scale for the whole uh, nation. And what they tried to do was bring back their rainforest, and it actually works. And payments are competitive. Uh, with the profits from farming and ranching, because no farmer is just going to, you know, give up an extra ten bucks for doing good. They need to be compensated a fair um, wage, okay? And that was done by the taxpayers' money, and that's okay with me. But that's a policy we need to discuss. The PSA program recognized four valuable ecosystem services, okay? So they concentrated on cleansing of the water and reduction of erosion. The richness of biodiversity, because without biodiversity, you'll never have resilience, and then you'll never have sustainability. We learned that last uh, PowerPoint, right? Scenic beauty and attractions for ecotourism. So they want to be profitable here. They want to make some money for these farmers. Is hey, maybe they can do some ecotourism instead of planting those crops. They can get some tours. <coughs> Excuse me. And then also carbon sequestration. Well, carbon dioxide is actually pulled from the atmosphere. And this is something <coughs> we really, excuse me, we really need to uh, start doing more here in the United States. First, though, we have to start uh, trying to uh, actually pay the full price of the carbon. So we need that carbon tax. The carbon sequestration uh, techniques are a little bit different. You got a credit. You actually get paid for sequestering um, the carbon that's in those tree trunks that you grow back in Costa Rica. Those tree trunks that grow back on the forest. We can calculate how much carbon is actually um, put into those trunks, just like we can calculate how much carbon was taken out and put into the atmosphere from your exhaust pipe from your car. Okay, and then we pay compensate them for doing a job for us, mending, tending to those trees and allowing them to grow and taking that sacrifice and not planting, um, you know, corn and making some money on the open uh, market, all right? Um, we should have more programs on things like this. We'll talk a little bit more in the soil or in the agriculture uh, section about this, what we call a regenerative agriculture. And, um, we try to get farmers to, uh, you know, try to pay them for carbon, to, that what they sequester in the soil as well as the trees, okay? Funding came from the beneficiaries of these ecosystem services, such as irrigators, bottlers, municipal suppliers, hydrological plant bar operators, all that stuff. And it was about, and, and, you know, these guys paid a little extra money for utilizing these ecosystem services. So the irrigators had the water. That was running down the river, so they got charged for that water, right? So did the bottlers and the water, uh, water supply companies and the, and the things, because that is an ecosystem service, okay? And it was also a 3.5% tax on fossil fuels, all right? So that would be a carbon tax right there. They're saying, hey, this is uh, – start. they didn't call it a carbon tax, but – that's basically what they're doing. Hey, the carbon you're putting out there, you're, you're hurting the environment. We're going to, 
you know, price that accordingly, all right? Not that it's more expensive. You are now paying the true cost according to what Costa Rica thinks. So Costa Rica had a debate of what that cost was, you know, like we talked about before. Uh, some people think it should be 50 bucks a ton. Some people think it should be for 500, and I think it should be a thousand. Okay, maybe even more. Uh, but you can see what has happened here. All right, in uh, Costa Rica in 1940, they had all this uh, all this tree cover. By 1987, it was totally decimated. But by 2005, it has grown and has you know coming back to where it was. Okay, not where it was, but it's looking a lot better than here. All right. So by 2015, more than 20% of the country's land area was registered in the program. Right? Uh, some payments were wasted on people who had no plans on removing tree or to remove trees, um, and much of the money went to the wealthiest landowners. So there are some disputes if these things work uh, properly, um, and they need to be watched and managed. All right, but the reason why we know this is that they watched and managed them. All right. No, no one is no project is actually perfect, uh, but you know they need to be need to be done sometimes. Overall, the program was uh, a success. So the forest cover rose from 17% in 1983 to 53 percent today. Real inflation adjusted income has risen from 60 percent. So people didn't go uh, bankrupt on this. Right? They actually inflation adjusted income. I mean, the dollar a day is equal. And it rose by 60%. So that loaf of bread, you were able to pay for that loaf of bread too. All right? So on flesh adjusted income means you add in the uh, you know, the loaf of bread, the dollar today, and if $2 tomorrow, that dollar is in this. All right? So we've got real money. This is real. This is the good. That's a good number. Um, Two million tourists visit the country vast system of natural parks each day, each year. So they have a vibrant ecotourism system. Uh, uh, industry and it's growing by leaps and bounds instead of uh, cutting down those trees you know saying come and come see them so economics and the environment so an economy is a social system that converts resources into goods and services so it is a social system it's a social science not necessarily a science like uh, medicine where we are studying all these hard things or some variables and economics that are intrinsic um, and extrinsic. So, we're, you know, there's some things that we, it's hard to put a price on. How do you put a price on loving a product? What we call utility, right? So goods are material commodities, right? Anything that you can touch. And services are work, or is work done by others. And that service could be digging a ditch or accounting or uh, consulting, okay? Um, economics is a study of how people use potentially scarce resources to provide goods and services that they demand. And you see here it says potentially scarce. Okay, we know that the first laws of thermodynamics is matter is never created or destroyed, and we also know that the second law of thermodynamics tells us that every time we use energy, we've got a little bit less to use. All right, so we are not really making anything. We are just moving matter around. And every time we move that matter around, we lose a little bit of energy. And it becomes harder and harder. So these are always potentially will be scarce resources out there due to the law of thermodynamics. But it's a good thing some things will take millions of years to get there. Okay. So economics receives input from the environment. And it processes them and discharges them back in the environment. So we take these natural resources, all the matter that Mother Nature gives us, and we get it out of here and put it into a new system, our economy. And we make all these widgets. We have labor uh, getting paid to make all these widgets for industry and businesses. And then the society goes, hey, I like that little widget. I'm going to buy it and use it at home. All right. Take it to the household, and the household goes, I need a little bit of money. And we go out there, we start working, making all these widgets and wages, uh, widgets for the industry so they can make a little bit of money, right? And it's just a big circle and recycling of the money flow through here 
utilizing these natural resources, this matter that we take out of the environment. And then everything goes into waste. And we actually pay somebody out there uh, to take away our waste. At the very end, we say goodbye, right? But there's also natural stuff that happens, right? So in ecosystem, eco ecosystems is always these ecosystem goods that will naturally go into the ecosystem surface and be naturally recycled back out right and you know there's the bio chemical cycles and uh, that we talked about before the water cycles that we talked about before okay uh, but when we rearrange all this matter into here sometimes mother nature cannot recycle it all right, when we get all that lead collected up in one place that used to be diffused all over the place and actually safe, generally considered safe for us to play around, it's now in one big old pile. We need to be careful. All right, and that's what has happened over time. All right, the natural resources of our ecosystem goods include like fresh water, trees, timber, and energy for the sun, wind, and all that um, good stuff. All right, and those are kind of limited in. In, in a sense, okay, we only have so much um, fresh water right now, and we need to keep it clean. So if we pollute it, it will no longer be useful for us. Trees, um, we are cutting down. Like we, you know, I hope someone did the uh, current event to see if uh, the Amazon is now not a car carbon sink. So when we cut down those trees, they no longer have that eco service, ecosystem service for us, and they're no longer uh, good. Right? Or we could over harvest just like we do in the story of the Lorax. Right? And we always got the sun, the wind, the water, and um, fossil fuels also are natural resources, but these are definitely also limited in quantity. Um, we also have what's called ecological services. So natural resources re are always there um, in different single use forms okay ecological services include the air water fabrication soil formation climate regulation all the things that make this tick the, the world tick and it's the flow of the energy through the system all right so water perfect purification will be like the ripen areas as the rain falls down and picks up all the pollutants before it gets into the water and the water gets down here and then all of a sudden the oysters are down in here just like in chesapeake bay uh filtering out the extra nitrogen so the uh lake doesn't go into a dead zone right and that's the ecological service all those different things that happen as that water gets cleaned right soil formation with the wind and the rain breaking down the uh land uh breaking down or uh, eroding down the rocks and f uh, making that first little little patch of something that that moss could grow on top of and then the moss comes in there and then the next thing you know we got the legions and then we got the little shrub grass and then we got the trees and secession has been got right that's an ecological service okay the bees pollinating the trees right um how do we, how much do we have to pay the bees to do that all right or even all the stuff that's breaking down our poop. Imagine how much if we didn't have the biodegraders out there. Um, economic theory moved from uh, theory moved from invisible hand to supply and demand. So there's this guy called Adam Smith, and he argued that self-interested economic behavior can benefit society as long as it is controlled. You hear this? As long as it is controlled. So you might hear adam smith or the phrase invisible hand a lot okay and this is the you know principle that you said if you know the market is allowed to act and self the people will be guided by this invisible hand to benefit society they won't want to do bad things they'll try to do the best thing because if they do the best thing for society that's how they're going to profit the most Okay, so why should we need to um, interfere? Okay, because they want to make money. They're self-interested individuals. And by doing what's best for society means they will make the most money. Unfortunately, Anna Smith, you know, he only talks about this thing twice in this book, maybe three times. All right, it's just, it's just on two different pages. Okay, and he says invisible hand once. Um. 
But he talks about collusion, that sometimes the maximum amount of money could be made by colluding with other people and not being doing what's best for society, but ripping off society. So if you're a good businessman, you also know how to manipulate the market to maximize your profit. Okay. <clears throat> Neoclassical economics also describes the conflict between buyers and sellers, right? The buyers want to pay the lowest price ever, and the uh, sellers want to uh, sell for the highest price ever. Okay, so I like to play the stock market a lot, and you know I want to buy high or buy uh, low and sell high, right? Or when I'm selling, I like to sell uh, high and buy low. Right, uh, that is just the the nature of the markets. Okay, the compromise as a result is supply and demand. The amount of product uh, offered for sale and the amount of things demanded at a certain price. And there's no uh, and when it's an efficient market, you'll get what's called an equilibrium point where the supply equals demand. So there'll always be as much supply out there. It would equal demand because no company really wants to have more supply than what's demanded. Okay, because that would be a waste of efficiency for them. They want to have, you know, they call it sometimes just in time inventory, just to have enough. Okay, and they won't ever, why would they want to make waste money? They will never produce more than they can sell. Right. Yes, they might make a mistake and someday the, the market might fall and no one wants to buy your widget anymore. I mean, that's business. That's a ri risk you can take. But in an efficient marketplace that we're talking about here, and we see the equilibrium point is that the market is actually efficient. They're not making any more than you can actually buy. So like when we say gross domestic product, it's really calculated by how much we actually consume. Because if we just thought about how much we bought or how much we produced here in America, we'd be leaving out all those widgets in China and in Mexico and Canada and everywhere else in the world. So what it really is is how much we're actually um, buying, not actually not producing. Okay, so that's kind of, but it is supply and demand. So. <clears throat> Uh, Cost-benefit analysis is what helps us do this, okay? We will compare the estimated cost of a proposed action with its benefits. Uh, the choice is uh, the greater ex excess of the benefits over the cost will be made. So if we can get more benefits over the cost, then we will actually try to we will purchase it or try to produce that widget. The problem with cost-benefit analysis arises though when not all costs and benefits are easily uh, identified. So what is the monetary value of ecological cost of clearing a forest, right? So we got that biodiversity we, that we've lost because we've cleared the forest. We got that carbon sequestration that we lost because we cleared the forest. We got that uh, temperature regulation because we've uh, cleared the forest. We got that soil. Uh, uh, holding in the soil because we destroyed the forest. So there's all those other costs that not necessarily are being attributed to clearing of that forest or that piece of the lumber that you're buying to build your home at. <clears throat> and that's what an ecological economist try, aims to try to do is try to find that price. So monetary benefits are usually more easily quantified than environmental costs. So the decisions are often based towards economic development. So we want to try to you know, make some money here and try to uh, increase our net worth. And we don't really always think about these environmental costs because that tree is going down. We'll make a killing this year, all right? But five years down the road, we won't have any the story of Lorax will have them. We won't have any Lorax to make those Lorax shirts or whatever they made there. Okay. So neoclassical economics assumes that natural and human resources are either infinite or they can be substituted easily when used up. So they know that fossil fuels are, are not, can be depleted and they are a finite source. But they also say, hey, we'll just find an Easily, an easy substitution for we'll just switch over from what we're using right now is uh, light crude oil, all right? 
And that's what's really started this whole thing. Now we're using this stuff called bitumen and creogen, all right? And it's still an, uh, a part of the oil family. It comes from the carbon chains of oil, um, but it's not the same as what we've been used to. So you, I don't know if you guys remember Beverly Hillbillies. Jed took that gun and shot it in the ground, and up came a bubble of crude. That's their light crude oil. Well, the bitumen and the creogen are actually uh, coming from what's called tar sands and fracking uh, shale. So we're doing some crazy stuff to get this, this stuff out. It doesn't even look like, I mean, it does look like it after the end product, but it's not coming out the same. You will discuss that a little bit more in the energy section. <clears throat> uh, soil, fish stocks, and uh, forest products can be overexploited. So we can't really find a substitute for some of these. I mean, what's our substitute for fish? We've got to eat something else. But once those fish stocks or once that soil or once that forest is totally gone or overexploited, they may not come back. All right? um, so we've got to be very uh, careful that we manage them in the, in the proper way. We manage them sustainable, uh, sustainably. Inexhaustible resources like water can become contaminated. So water will, it will always be here on Earth. We'll, ne we'll never uh, run out of water. We've got all that, oxygen, all that uh, water in the ocean and stuff like that. Uh, but it could become so polluted that we cannot clean it anymore. And we'll talk a little bit about this more in the, in the uh, energy section. But we, use, we do something called fracking. And fracking for natural gas and oil takes a lot of water. And that water, once we put it down there and draw it back up, uh, is no longer uh, cleanable. We can't. We don't know what to do with it. So we take it, we inject it back down into the ground and say, don't come back. All right, so we take all this fresh, clean water that we used to be able to drink um, and bathe in and do all that stuff. We make it totally uh, useless, and we take it off of the water cycle okay, by putting it back down in the ground. So it's actually taken out of the water cycle. Amazing. So neoclassical economics always takes into account internal costs. And, or those directly borne by the individual taking part in the economic change, uh, or economic uh, exchange. So the internal cost would be just the things that you can touch. Like if you're uh, you know, wanting to go buy a mouse, the internal cost would be the labor going into building that mouse, the plastic, the um, internal wires, the lighting, all that rigmarole, and a little bit of goodwill. All right would be the internal cost of that mouse. But there's some external costs um, that might be affecting others um, that we may not be in, in that equation of the total internal cost of that little widget. All right. So what were the health uh, impacts of getting this uh, plastic for the uh, mouse? All right. That plastic uh, was done through fracking. All right. Was there any where that... Um, uh, natural gas came to make the plastic for the mouse. Was well, was there any health impact when that was being actually extracted from um, the ground? Right, depletion of uh, resources. Uh, so declines in the abundance or loss of uh, natural resources to provide wealth to substances such as fish, game, and wildlife. So was anything poisoned while we were making this stuff like that? So there's also aesthetic damages. You can see here with the trees, take down all these different trees, and no longer but beautiful. I mean, that's what happened with Costa Rica. I mean, part of their initiative was, I think, number four was to make it beautiful again so they could do those ecotourism a little bit more. And there's also financial loss. So, you know, the global warming is coming up here, and uh, I think we talked about this a little bit in the global warming industry, or the section that they... Uh, insurance industry is you know, getting a little bit uh, sensitive to uh, global warming, and they don't really want to be uh, insuring a house that is in Florida or on the Louisiana coast or Gulf Coast th th these days uh, due to the increased uh, strength of hurricanes. Not necessarily the strength amount of hurricanes, just the, the hurricanes are getting bigger and getting stronger. And causing more damage, and they are having trouble co uh, covering uh, the losses. Okay. The third assumption in neoclassical economics is discounting. So 
when the future effects are, are granted less weight than the present ones. So many environmental problems are unfold gradually, so the impact decision made, made to benefit in present generations are often left to the next generation to deal with. I think I talked about way back when when we had the, uh, I don't know if I told the story or not, but the uh, Indians that used to live here, the Alegue Indians that used to live in this little region, uh, they had a really the first con written constitution out there. Um, it's called the Law of Peace, the Great Law of Peace. And they had like little states. So, you know, Maine and Pennsylvania or like one little Indian tribe and in Ohio and stuff was another. So just like kind of like, you know, looks here. They had their own little states and their own little constitution. And they, um, you know, had any disputes. They placed them across. Seriously, that's what they did. All right. Uh, but one of the motives, one of the things in the Constitution is that the women ran things. They really made all the political decisions. So it was inverse from what we had, right, uh, from the United States Constitution in the beginning. Men have made all the decisions. Here, the women did. And part of the decision-making was, how was this going to affect the tribe in seven years from now or in seven generations from now? Holy cow, seven generations, that's, a, that's some well, you know, futuristic thinking. But that was all part of the thinking process, and we need to do that a little bit more. Because also we're thinking about this now is here and today. All right? Very rarely will I even hear about a business even trying to attempt to do a 50-year plan. All right? And then we're using a two, a three, a five, and a ten. When I did my business plan to start my CSA, I only had it go out uh, ten years. Okay? Uh, but I did have a, a thought of my 50-year plan, but that's still not the second generation. But I got my next generation, my daughter is going to take it over, and she's already working on it, right? So she's going to be the, the next generation. Uh, but I'm not doing seven generations, that's for sure. The fourth assumption is that the increase in production and consumption in goods and services called economic growth is essential for maintaining social order. And this is the key. This is... This is what really makes neoclassical economics, neoclassical economics is the economic growth. And I think we talked about this a lot um, already. And we'll talk about it a little bit more. So economic growth means that we consume more than we consumed last year. So gross domestic product is how much we actually consume, right, as a, as a nation. So in 2020, if we don't consume more than we consumed in 2019, we stink, all right? We have negative GDP. We just might have a negative GDP this year because of the pandemic, right? And it'll be the first year in a long time since the Great uh, Recession, since uh, Obama took over and those, you know, the way back when, all right? Uh, a 2008 financial crash, crash. But every year we have been, on an average, have been consuming about 3%, 3.5% more goods and natural resources than we have the next year, all right? And if we use that law of 70 and divide that in, so every, what, every, what, what is that, three divided by so 20, 60 years, we're doubling our consumption. It's amazing, all right? Every 20 years, we're doubling our consumption. Can Is that really sustainable? And, you know, in this growth and with limited resources is not sustainable, Okay. That's what that whole uh, video was in the beginning with the, the most important video you ever um, see was about, right? We can't have endless growth with limited resources. So issues with the assumptions of classical economics have led to the field of environmental economics, where the goal is to attain sustainability with our economic systems. And the biggest problem to tackle is the lack of accounting and external cost uh, and use for these discounting. So the field of economics, uh, ecological economics, takes the position that economics should attain sustainability, uh, much like natural populations do in the face of environmental um, limitations, okay? Carrying capacity and ecological footprint, right? We only have one Earth, and that is the carrying capacity for man, period. Okay, we're not going to get any more matter down here. Now, having said that, a meteor might fall down and give us a couple more nuggets of gold or 
a couple more molecules of H2O or something like that. Okay, that is a possibility. But really, we what we have is what we have, and that's it. Okay. And ecological footprint would be what the population is extracting from there to live, right? So it's not really, you know, it doesn't matter what the ecological care capacity is. Our ecological footprint is what we're extracting. So if we calculate what we're extracting, and if that is greater than the carrying capacity of the earth, we're in trouble. Right? So we want to make sure that the carrying capacity of the earth equal is, is less is greater than or equal to our ecological footprint. If we do that, we are living sustainably. If we are not, if our ecological footprint is greater than our carrying capacity of the earth, then we are an overshoot. And we know overshoot is not a good thing, right? Because that means that sooner or later, Mother Nature is going to take over and control the population itself. Right? And this lady right here, Kate Rowland, she invented, uh, or not invented, but she is part of the sustainable development kind of stuff. And she's been working on it for a long, long time. She came up with the, with the concept of what's called donut economics. It's a new way of thinking about the sustainability stuff that we're talking about here in ecological economics. Right? And what we look at is we look in the middle here. We got these words like water and income and education, resilience, voice, jobs, energy, social equality, gender equality, and health and food, right? So what we want to make sure is that everybody in a society has enough food, all right? If they have enough food, that means that they will be up here in this part of the donut. And if they don't have enough food, this will be like a little red mark, okay, saying that they're, they're hurting. And water, we want everybody to be up in here. Okay, they want to have enough clean water. If not, we got to work on it and try to get them up here. Okay, and income and education. Some of this stuff is, you know, you need to decide for yourself and put in your eth your ethics how much income these people need. Should we have a minimum wage? Should we have a wealth tax? That kind of stuff. That's you know, that's the political debates, right? But we want to make sure that everybody can have enough income, in my humble opinion, to make sure that they can have buy some food and some water and have some health care and all that other stuff. So some of these are, you know, a value judgment. But we want to try to make sure everybody's in this donut. But we've got to remember the ecological services that we have out here, okay? The things that keep us alive, like biodiversity keeps us alive, land use change, climate change, very, you know, in the thermostat, are we changing the heat, Okay. Fresh water use, so we over withdrawing the water or polluting it too much, right? Do we got a lot of algae blooms going on? Those kind of things. And if we're out here in the red, you know, past this little donut, that society is basically uh, messing with the geo biochemical bio cycles out there, and they need to do something about it. Okay. And there's an interesting uh, website, this Good Life. Uh, leads here. I, there's the link, but I already brought it up, so we don't have to waste time with me loading it. All right, but this is like Kate Lawrence's uh, website, and it develops it really into something else. Okay, so you know, please go and spend some time on here, but then it's pretty neat because you can compare countries. All right, so we'll go to the country comparison, and what do we got here? This is the United Kingdom. Let's go to Costa Rica. See what Costa Rica. Let's see, see, Costa Rica. Right there. Let's look at the United States. Let's see what the United States is doing. Okay. So there we go. Here's the donuts for Costa Rica and the United States. You can see here is the United States. And we are in overshooting all the biochemical stuff except for blue water. Right? We just got a little bit of this. This is the ocean capacity, okay? Yeah, I'm pretty sure this is ocean capacity. Maybe not. Maybe it's all water, too. Looks a little bit different than that other uh, donut. It might have changed it a little bit on us, uh, the categories. But you can see these are the big, bio, yeah, the, you know, the environmental services that we are in overshoot from. In Costa Rica, they're not perfect, all right? But they are starting to get a little bit up here with the CO2 emissions, right? But they're paying those farmers to bring that down, try to get back into the donut range. Okay, 
Um, and in the inside is the social stuff. So Costa Rica is definitely doing great, you know, uh, in the social um, places. They still got EQ, which is EQ. I thought the EQ, equality, all right? So equality, probably men and women, equality, gender equality, all that stuff, all right? And then EM, which is employment. All right, and you can see the United States too has that problem with that too. Um, EQ with equality, and we have some problems with equality, believe you me. All right, and EM employment, and um, this was done probably before the Great Recession. So we really, you know, we've been hurting on the employment. It's not just um, you know having a, a good employment number that you hear on the news or what have you. It's also about having um, enough income. You know, a, a job that's going to pay you what uh, they call sustainable development or a living wage, right? Is one job enough to pay for, you know, your room and board, okay? And that's hard to find sometimes in, in the United States. So take a look at this uh, website. It's very interesting. You got a lot, you know, look around there. You got the world map that goes on here, all the different scenarios. and It tells you about the data. You can download the data and use it yourself, Okay. You know, it's a well, it's well organized and a well um, open source. Okay, that's what science is all about. Um, even a social science from uh, in economics, we got to close how we come up with the uh, numbers. Okay, so this is a new way of thinking. This is the way I try to think too. I try to think and go in an economics to make sure everybody has these little needs. All right, and you might not think that education is a need, but I, I do. We can discuss that. Okay, you might not think that resilience is a need, but I think so. Um, you know, voice, Second Amendment kind of thing, uh, First Amendment kind of things. Okay, and these are open for discussion. Like I said, how many calories do you need? How many gallons of water? That's kind of basic, but some of these are harder to um, harder to assess. Everybody have, will have a different opinion, uh, but we can't come to a common ground. So what we try to do with sustainable development and, and ecological economics is hit what's called a steady state, right? which would mirror ecological systems neither by growing nor shrinking, but rather establishing a national equilibrium. So remember in you know the S curve that starts up, you know the J curve of our population goes up here, and then all of a sudden we're an overshoot, okay, and then we come crashing back down. But what we try to do with ecological economics is, yes, growth is a necessary condition for any population in any society. It does need to have that exponential um, curve to shoot up to, to, to make sure it's a viable population, right? Because we need that genetic diversity and all this other kind of stuff that goes on with a, with a bigger population or a well-sized population. But eventually, that, that S curve, uh, that J curve, needs to turn flatten out and turn into an S curve. We want to stay right up in here in that steady state. So everybody is with inside this donut little area. If we go out here, we're coming into overshoot, right? If we don't make it, then the society's, you know, not, not booming at all, okay? So attaining sustainability require, will require the reforms of environmental economics, um, and change its attitude and advocate, advocate it by um, ecological economics. So one important approach is to assign monetary values to economic goods and services. Not just all the widgets, but we got to start giving Lake Erie its due, right? And we talked about that one group wants to give Lake Erie some rights, you know. We at least got to admit and notice the ecological services that it puts out and starts Give them a little bit of a you know monetary value to those services, and we need to make that part of the cost benefits analysis uh, as well. Uh, one guy famous puts it: we need to uh, neoclassical economics and environmental neoclassical economics need to learn how to subtract, right? Because every time we have a hurricane, um, there's a cost of a billion dollars that fix everything up. But guess what? That goes into the GDP and that helps out. That increases the GDP because of buying more wood. Okay? If that hurricane never happened, that piece of lumber would never have been sold to that other person to redo their home. Okay? So sometimes, you know, is that a plus or is that a minus? Sometimes we might have to start subtracting. 
Ecosystem services are said to have a non-market value as well, meaning that they're not you know, part of a price or a good or a service. So there's, you know, it's just some intrinsic value uh, to this that you can't, you know, intangible values that we can't really touch, right? Such as uh, aesthetics or scientific benefits, um, educational values, all these different things that are really, even though uh, we don't directly pay for them, uh, we definitely get a benefit from just going out and getting that warm fuzzy for seeing the, the tiger out in the wild or being able to get that thrill of uh, mountain climbing, right? And looking out here and seeing all the beautiful aesthetic beauty out there, okay? What is the price of that view? Right, and I think you gotta be crazy first of all to even climb up here, but to each its own. I'm not here to judge you. Um, accounting for non market values like these improve economics and environmental decisions. So, once we uh, can find out what's like the optimum value worth of something we might uh, might use later, okay, the growth of a tree, we can find out, you know, we do these economic models that the tree today, if we let it grow, you know. What's the ideal size, the aesthetic value, uh, the worth of something's beauty, and the national um, emotional appeal. So we need to, you know, talk about those values because unfortunately, all we have really to to do this kind of stuff is price, all right? But what is the price of the the beauty of the Grand Canyon? What is the price of uh, going out there and keeping these? Um, ancient uh, picture graphs or whatever they're called, uh, you know, viable so we can, you know, other generations can learn from them as well, okay? So economics have sought ways to assign market value to ecosystems for a while now. Now, one research team collected seven valuation of 17 major ecosystem services and Reanalyzed the data and multiple value across the total global area, and they calculated in this 2014 study that the Earth's biosphere, in total, provided about 125 trillion dollars worth of ecosystem services each year, and that is in 2007 dollars, right? So 125 trillion dollars worth of services that are basically free. Because we're not paying the bees to pollinate, right? We're not paying the trees to uh, take in that carbon dioxide and sequester the carbon and send us out some oxygen, right? But if we were to do that, um, man, you know, manually, I guess, um, it would be worth $125 million. And this is equal to about $148 trillion in 2017 dollars. So you can see here, which would be the... the um, rate of inflation, so $225 uh, trillion in 2007 was now worth $148 trillion. Whew. That's a right there, nice rate of inflation. Uh, the amount that exceeds the global annual monetary value of goods and services created by the people. So uh, we, you know, the earth gives us more services than we actually do as a society. And you can see all the different things. From the storing of water and supplies, to regu regulating the water, cycling of the nutrients, to uh, enable a regular recreation, uh, to have school a little towards providing education, uh, controlling erosion, that's $16 trillion, Pollinating at the plants, how much is the bees worth? Point two trillion dollars, right? So there's all these different things, and that's what ecological economists kind of do um, is adding this up. And this is where, where we also get some of our ecological footprint and things like that, and how put together that donut economics model. Okay, so all these different little things are pretty neat to think about. All the things that Mother Nature provides for us, we don't even think about in our daily lives. I always like to say when you know I got into what I do now because I started you know, worming and feeding uh, worms my garbage and they would eat the, my uh, leftover paper and, and paper scraps and coffee grounds and stuff like that. And my favorite saying is worms don't talk back, right? I would put my garbage in there 
and you know organic waste in there and it would turn into this black gold and they wouldn't they wouldn't fuss at all they wouldn't they wouldn't run away they wouldn't you know yap they wouldn't bark they wouldn't do anything they would just sit there and just eat eat poop and have sex that's all they did unbelievable must be nice being warm so we can measure uh, progress with full cost accounting methods so the, the economic the economy of this nation has traditionally been assessed using the gross domestic not gross domestic product GDP, right? The total monetary value of goods and services produced in a year. Remember, this is really consumed because it's not just United States; it's what all the United States consumes, even the stuff that is produced in China. Okay, so you know, I just want to stress that a lot of times. I don't know why I do. You guys probably knew that by now. So, but it doesn't account for non-market values of both desirable and undesirable um, economic activity. So we, we forget to subtract sometimes. And it just, um, you know, that's what we go for. And that's why uh, that one guy in a video way back when said, hey, in growth we trust, that's what we really do. That we, if we don't have a positive gross domestic product, if we don't spend buy more stuff than we did the year before, we stink. Right? And then it's considered a bad economy. Okay? But we cannot do that forever. It's not going to last forever, that's for sure. So what ecological economists uh, have decided, you know, you know, I've talked about it's changing it and doing it to an alternative which is called the genuine progress indicator which adds up um, unpaid positive contributions um, that aren't out there too okay such as parenting or volunteering um, and volunteering gives an added service but no one actually pays any money for it. parenting it's an added service but no one actually pays any money for it it's an interesting how the uh, Economist came up with this too and started thinking about this because he used to have a um, an assistant who would go out and do all this stuff for him, right? And they ended up falling in love, getting married. When they got married, he stopped paying her for that. Unbelievable! And he realized, you know, hey, this is you know, maybe this should go back on the genuine progress indicator because um, there's some extra money being made here that or a service being provided that is not being compensated for. Okay, so the GDP in the United States has increased steadily over the past few years, but the GPI, the genuine progress, has remained uh, largely flat. So if we go back and we look at, you know, the genuine progress indicator from what we thought back way back when, from 1950, you can see it's been relatively flat. So we're not really making any progress. We're just staying a little flat. But you can see our production is going up and up and up and up and up and up. All right. Our consumption, I should say, is going up and up and up and up. So the GPI is an example of what's called full cost accounting because it includes all the costs and benefits. So other indices, and these other ones called the Human Development Index, the uh, Happiness Index, the Economic Freedom Index. There's a lot of these different indexes out there. So, you know, economics is not just... You know what you learn here at Robert Morris and uh, micro and macro. Uh, there's a lot more um, branches out there. And use your, your critical thinking skills and go out there and check them out and see if you agree with them or not. Okay. Uh, there's also what's called the Happy Planning Index, which measures the amount of happiness that we gain from uh, resource consumed. So Co Costa Rica is a high performing. Uh, country by this index, so they don't even they use the happiness index in Costa Rica, right? They don't use GDP, GDP to evaluate their um, economies. And I would love to do use the happiness index here in, in in the United States to get rid of that GDP. That would be one of my favorite uh, things to do. Okay, so why don't we stop there? And when we get next time, we'll start getting into why markets fail and some stuff like that. So. Remember, your test will be uh, available to you tomorrow, and you have until next Wednesday to take it. Um, if you guys have any questions or concerns or problems or whatever, just uh, drop me a line, and I will be glad to uh, try to help you out. Thanks. Bye-bye.